press into a, a subject here that I've, I've, I probably haven't preached on maybe once or twice in, in, in my whole ministry, but it's been, it's been uh, on my mind, and I've been waiting, studying this out of probably three months ago, and God just, you're going to have to direct me and let me know when, and I feel like, I feel like today is probably the day. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. And we're going to cover quite a few scriptures. Um, I'm going to talk about baptism, water baptism, and maybe like you've never heard it before. Uh, I hope not. I, well, I wish that everybody, everybody seen it the same and talked about it the same and preached it the same, but, but that's not the case. There's a lot of different ideas about it. In 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20 said, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is in eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us, it equivocates baptism with part of the plan of salvation. But it's not the putting away the filth of the flesh. It's important you see that. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, when the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea, they were leaving Egypt behind. They was leaving disobedience behind. They was leaving idolatry behind. They was leaving 400 years of, of just being steeped in pagan idolatry behind. They was leaving captivity behind. And they passed through the Red Sea. And it was a form of baptism that took place. And they survived. The Egyptians that followed behind got a different kind of baptism. They didn't. But, and again, you'll read later in, 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 in the book of, uh, let's see, Exodus, Joshua, Leviticus, Joshua. Again, they passed through the flooding Jordan. They've been out in the wilderness for 40 years, struggling with a lot of the things they supposedly left behind in Egypt. They'd made their own island. They, they went to giving in marriage and, and, and intermarrying with, with, with people that wasn't Serving God, wasn't children of God. But now before they, just before they get a walk into the promised land, the Jordan's flooding, and God speaks to Joshua, and he leads them through the river Jordan. God opens up the water. They walk through, as I think it says, as the high priest's ankles touch the water, the water began to roll back. Leaving behind more disobedience and hardship brought on by faithlessness. How many knows what it is to be faithless? The Bible said we've all given a measure of faith, but I know I've been caught faithless in some situations. Amen. Uh, that's, how how, how many has ever cried that, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. That's, that's where faith isn't operating. You're faithless in that area. Mark chapter 9 verse 12 said, And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. Now we don't read anything, I, I don't recall reading anything about baptism until 
until you're up here and in the wilderness, John the Baptist is preaching and he's crying out. And here in Mark chapter 9, verse 12, it said, And he answereth and told them, Elias barely cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things to be said at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. He's making reference to what John the Baptist done. And John the Baptist reintroduced or, or, or restored baptism and the idea of baptism and the idea of, of putting away the old man and putting away the flesh. Early in my ministry, I got pulled into helping somebody baptize some folks. And, and I'll tell you right now, I am against overemphasis of baptism because I have been a participant of, of taking sinners to the water, dunking them, and they come up and, and they, you never see them in church, you never see a change in their life, and they think they're okay because they never really got saved. But because of the overemphasis of baptism, they think that they are. And, and you know, John the Baptist didn't even practice it that way. When the fact, scribes and the Pharisees came out and they wanted him to baptize them, he said, go forth and bring forth meat for repentance. I want to see there's been a change in your life. You can make this public proclamation after I see that you mean business. But I'm not going to be a part of a lie or a scam that you pull on the people or even yourself. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. We, now, now I have everybody's attention a little bit. John restored baptism among other things. He said he restored all things. That's a heavy. There was none greater born of woman than John. Amen. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, and we're going to get into this that, that so familiar. I, I, I can't believe that I, I believe I could preach on this without addressing this. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 17 through 20 said, And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. They worshiped him. Who they worship? Jesus. He said, All power. Who's power? All power. Who's got power? Who had power? God's got power. And right? Angels have power. I guess the devil's got a little power on loan. But he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Amen. And all those disciples understood exactly what he said. Because every example you'll find in the Bible of anybody being baptized from that point forward, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You can't find it any other way. And that stuck with the church until, uh, I think it was 325 A.D., but Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, 1910, volume 2, page 365, said the Trinitarian formula of the trine immersion were not uniformly used from the beginning. Baptism in the name of the Lord was the normal formula. I, I know they was a little bit afraid to even say it here. But they said baptism in the name of the Lord was the normal formula of the New Testament. In the third century, baptism in the name of Christ was still so widespread that Pope Stephen, in opposition to the Cy Cyprian and Carthage, declared it to be valid. So they, they still have to compromise on what they wanted to do well into the 300s. Because everybody understood who the name of the Father was. Well, who is the name of the Father? By inheritance, he hath obtained a more excellent name than they all. Who did he inherit it from? He inherited it from the Father. That invisible power entity 
that you and I call God. Amen? And, and the angel came and told Mary what to name him because he was inheriting a name. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, so in the name of the Father and of the Son, we know he was called, he, he was told, or Mary was told to name him Jesus. He inherited that name. So we can say firmly and, and with, with confidence the Father's name has been revealed to us in the old in the New Testament is Jesus. Jesus' name was Jesus. And then he said, I'll send you a comforter in my name. Whose name? His name. What's his name? It's Jesus. So, you know, I, we don't have to play this game about make sure we mention each individual uh, office or each individual person or personage of the Godhead when we pray. Friend, when you say Jesus, you've said it all. Amen. You've addressed the whole, the Bible said, Paul understood this way, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Amen. Is there, is there salvation under any other name? I know not any. Hallelujah. All right, so we, we understand this. We, we, we're, 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 I think we're all in agreement on this. In, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 said, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, when they crossed the Red Sea, when they, when they crossed Jordan, they're leaving something behind. When, when, when John the Baptist was baptizing, he reintroduced baptism, restored that, they're leaving that old life behind. But now, in the New Testament, it takes a little different tilt. You're not just leaving it behind. He said, know you that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. We're supposed to die out to this world. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. Amen. It's not just a ritual we go through. It is a public proclamation. It is, it is, is an important part of what we believe and what we do. You should do it too. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, I'd love to be the one to do it for you. Amen. I, I, we, we've been given a, a, a access to a big baptismal here. We've got a big river right over there. We, I'm sure we can find, scrounge up a pond or a creek someplace if that's what you'd rather do. It doesn't matter to me. But if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, I would love to baptize you. Amen. If, you, if you've made things square between you and God, and I don't know of anybody here that I'm talking to this afternoon that has, doesn't proclaim to be a Christian, and I haven't seen anything to, that calls me to scratch your name from that list. You say, well, so-and-so, you, you know, go ahead and point fingers. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all messed up at times. Raymond was talking about grace, and without it, we'd all be headed straight for hell. Amen. But, but I, when I look around, and the Bible said I, I wouldn't know them because they belonged to an organization, because they went through a ritual. He said, I'd know them because my spirit would bear witness with their spirit. Amen. And, 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 and that I'd also know them because they have love one for another. Aren't you glad you got love in your heart? Heart. Hallelujah. Amen. Now look at this. He said in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, And Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise of, is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, here we're getting into a crux of the map on how this is read. And it's and it's and it's a heavily used scripture among friends of ours. He baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You know it's said for. I, I believe I'm no I'm no English major. My my wife, I don't see her here. She didn't major in English, but she took a lot of college English. But I believe that four is a preposition. And, but, it, but we're 
much mean things. It doesn't say this is the remission of sin. It says it's for the remission of sin. And I'm about to, about to bring out some things here to help you understand part of the issue that, that, that I have with this and why I'm preaching this this morning. Amen. And, and Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 said, For by grace are you saved through faith. faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, so who saves you? Do I save you? Do you save you? He saves you. You say, well, I saved me. I, I got down there and prayed. Well, first off, he paid the price so you could. And you can't call him Lord unless he draws you. So he saved you. Well, no, no, no. My, my pastor saved me. He baptized me in Jesus' name. No, no, no. No. It's a gift from God. Amen? Now look at this. This is where I, I have issues. And, 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 I, I, and I think that it's been pressed a little out of kelter for the glory of man. But look at what it says here. Amen. <clears throat> where, where am I? Remission of sins, you shall receive the gift. All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's important to have good works. But works does not save you. And, and here's the issue that I have with a lot of people's take on baptism. They've turned it into the work that saves you. Now, salvation is a gift from God. And when we overemphasize a part of the plan, and then we take, we take credit for it, we're walking on dangerous ground. And I, I, I've been around friends, i got friends who bragged about how many people they saved that day because how many they baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think God's happy with it. Because it gives them credit. And another reason why it, it, it's, it doesn't fit with the Bible, just, 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 hope, just bear with me here a minute. I, I'm not going to just give you my opinion. We're going to go down through the scriptures with this. If you'll just bear with me. Not of works, lest any man should boast. There's been a lot of boasting about who ought. And I'm going to tell you right now, I may preach a message and, and cause somebody to make a decision for Jesus, but I didn't save anybody. Jesus saved him. Amen, amen. I might have dunked him in water once they made that commitment, but I didn't save him. Jesus saved him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 20 said, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Now we're getting where the blood is. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Who? Jesus. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. He's also talking about what happened in the Old Testament. In the, in the, in the Old Testament, the high priest would go in to the holiest of holies and he'd sprinkle on the mercy seat the blood of that unblemished lamb that was sacrificed. The Passover. We just talked about Passover here a couple weeks ago. When does the blood being applied? The blood was being applied at Passover. Guess when Jesus was crucified? At Passover. That, that's why, that, that's one reason why you, you'll read there was three Sabbaths in a row took place right there. And he was crucified. They had to get him off the cross before the Sabbath hit. They said, go break his legs. And they didn't have to break his legs because he was already dead. They buried him. He was in the tomb for three days, three nights, three days and three nights, and there was there was Sabbath, 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 and then they discover the tomb's open and it's empty. Hallelujah, 
Amen. But, but he shed his blood at Calvary. He shed his blood on the day of Passover. And, and here it said, moreover, he sprinkled with blood the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And verse 22 said, no, most all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So who shed the blood? The Lamb shed the blood in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Lamb shed the blood. Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. Who gets to apply the blood? In the Old Testament, it was the high priest. He was the only one that could apply the blood. He walked in the holiest of holies, and he applied the blood to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Who gets to apply the blood of the New Testament? Friends, let me tell you something. It's still the high priest. And the Bible said, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Look at this. He said, he said it was therefore necessary. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. He said, look, what he shed on, on, on Mount Calvary on that day, amen, it was, was, was more precious. It was more pure. It was more holy. It was, it was, more, it was more hard bought than, 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 than the blood of blemishless sheep. Amen. But verse 24 said, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. You hear what that's saying? For who? Christ he has not, is not entered into the holy places made with hands. He didn't walk into the tabernacle in Jerusalem. Oh, no, 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 no. What, what's that? Which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Amen. Verse 25 said, Nor yet that he should offer himself often. What? How many ever heard of a doctrine called transubstantiation? You ever heard of that? And the Catholic priest would lift up a cup of wine. And he'll bless him. And he'll say, now this is the blood of Christ. Do you believe that? This is, not, not figuratively, this is literally the blood of Christ. Don't you believe that? They killed they killed Protestants by the thousands because we didn't believe it. You lift up the Eucharist or that bread wafer and bless it. So this is literally the body of Christ. Don't you believe that? Well, no, I don't believe it. Well, get in line because we'll kill you along with the other thousands. Okay? God never intended for that. I'm not against drinking a little cup of grape juice to remember. I'm not against eating a little cracker to remember. But I'm not going to lie to you and tell you this is the literal blood and this is the literal body. Now, I will tell you this. When we get into that word, that is the bread of life. Amen. That is the body. We get into a spirit. That is the blood of Christ. Amen. That is that communion in his spirit. Oh, but listen. He said for then, he said for, in verse 25 said, Hebrews 9, verse 25 said, Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. His blood, more precious. Isn't that right? Are we in agreement with that? Jesus Christ's blood is more precious than the blood of the lambs. It's not offered every year like they did in the Old Testament because that blood lost its effectiveness in one year. Jesus walked in to a holy place in heaven. 
he applied blood. What? I don't know if I believe that, but you read your scripture. You read what I'm reading to you right now, Hebrews chapter 9. It said, verse 26, said, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. How many thinks that Jesus has to go on that cross over and over and over and over and over again? He did it one time for all eternity. Hallelujah. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. How did we get the application of blood for salvation mixed up with the demonstration of burial of the old man? Jesus didn't shed any blood in the tomb. He was dead. Well, it's quiet now. That's all right. I want you to think about this. People have played fast and loose with this and confused the matter, and it's time we get it right in our heart. There's a right way, there's a right thing, and there's a right understanding. Now, I agree with a whole bunch of people about what we're doing or how we're doing it, but not about what we're doing. Because I don't think I, by any ritual, can save any of you. That price has been paid. It's up to you and I to be obedient. Amen? But when I lay you down in water, I'm burying your old man that you might be buried with Christ. And then when you come up out of the water... Just as he resurrected on the third day, we're not going to hold you under three yet three days unless I really think you need it. Oh my! <laughs> Amen. But but when we re when we come up out of that water, we're resurrected as he did when he come up out of that tomb, and things are going to be different. And let me tell you something: things was different when him when he come out of that tomb. Before he went to that tomb, he still he still would bleed. He, they could still hurt him and smite him and do as they wished. But you know what? They never tried one time when he walked up out of that tomb. Amen. Things were different. Things were different. Hallelujah. And friend, when you get resurrected with the Lord and you make that proclamation, things will be different in your life and your friends and your neighbors. Everybody will notice that things are different. In First John. John chapter 5 verse 7 said for there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. one. Amen. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, the water and the blood and these three agree in one. Amen. The Passover the blood applied the Red Sea Amen. Wilderness, circumcision, Jordan. Jesus was our lamb. Amen. There, there was blood. There was a death. There was a sacrifice. There was blood application. There was a burial. Amen. And with you and I paid that price, and all we have to do is accept that price that he's paid. My Lord, my God. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 said this, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. You know, it didn't say the blood of baptism or the blood of washing, amen, but the blood of sprinkling. He cleansed us by the application of blood in the same manner that the shadows of the high priest did when he walked in the holiest of holies and he sprinkled that Passover lamb on the mercy seat. Friend, you and I have mercy forever because he sprinkled it. And it's up to you and I to step forward and say, yes, Lord, I believe, I accept, and I'll do my very best to live up to the principles that you taught. Amen. Redeem me, cleanse me, and let me walk forward in newness of life. Well, before you can walk in newness of life, maybe you ought to lay that old corpse down. Amen. And find somebody to bury him that you might walk out of the tomb just like he did. My God, my God. Amen. I'm not trying to strip anything from it. I'm just trying to set it in its seat where it belongs. Amen. Because I don't think anybody should glory out of salvation other than Jesus Christ and Him alone. Hallelujah. 
1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 said, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's, he's teaching that over in Peter. I've heard so much rhetoric. I, I was years deep in ministry before I realized, oh, I'm not getting baptized in blood. There's no Bible for that. You're not getting baptized in blood. You're getting it applied. You're getting it sprinkled or smote upon. But it's not a head to toe thing. But it's a cleansing thing. And where's it taking place? It didn't take place in the little canal river. Didn't take place in a fishing hall. Didn't take place in a baptismal. It took place in heaven. Jesus walked in one time to pay that price. Why do we get baptized? According to Acts chapter 2 verse 38, it's for the remission of sins. But it is not the remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's where we confuse. There's where those two scriptures, somebody tied them together one day and said, this is how it works. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, remission of sins. Right? And that scripture is true. In Acts 2.38 said, for the remission of sins. And that scripture is true. But for does not mean is. He's not going to share his glory with somebody else. Well, we shouting now, aren't we? It's all right. It's important. It's important that we understand. It would scare me to death to stand up and talk about how many people I've baptized in Jesus' name and say, I saved them. I'll tell you what, if they didn't get saved before they got to the water hole where I was at, they're still lost. Because me and my magic puddle didn't do anything. <laughs> All I can do is throw them in the grave and hope they leave the old man down there. But the real operation of salvation takes place in an invisible, an invisible place where he walked in. A place not made with hands. Amen. Hallelujah. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit. What? Well, cleansing of the Spirit. Sanctification, that's you're cleansing. What, what's cleaning you? Uh, uh, church bylaws? No, the Spirit. God gets a hold of you, me or no other preacher got to chase you down and go through your closet and go through your medicine cabinet and go through, go through your pockets to make sure you're living for God. The Spirit will sanctify you. If you want to live for Him, He'll clean you up. Amen? Well, amen. Amen, brother. That's good preaching right there. <laughs> Sanctification of the, of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because it don't matter how much you clean up yourself, if the price that he paid at Calvary isn't applied, you and I don't have a snowball's chance. Because without the application of his blood, there's no cleansing. And without... Without the sanctification of the Spirit, then He imparts unto you His righteousness. Your cleaning yourself up it still ain't going to work. Your righteousness is nothing but filthy rights. But when He imparts His, then we become as He wants, kings and priests. But I'm not worthy. Yeah, well, neither am I. But if we do our part and do our best, he said that we are kings and priests. Do you realize there was nobody that functioned in that office except Melchizedek? There was, a, there was a king back in the Old Testament, Josiah. I think it was Josiah. He was a king and he decided, I'm going to be a priest. I'm going to walk in. I'm going to walk in and do the priest thing. And, and up to then, he was living good. God, God liked him and, and he liked God, but he's... I, I want to get closer. I'm going to, I'm going to be the 
priest and a king. God said, no, you won't. And he smote him with leprosy. The only other one that, that I find all recorded was Melchizedek. And you know, he had no beginning, no end. I believe it's a manifestation of God. But when we, but the Bible said that we, we become like him. He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's talking about us. We get to be like, and the, and the Bible said, and we'll be his kings and priests. And that, that gives you spiritual authority and also gives you natural authority. You ever notice when somebody's really living for God, just about whatever they put their hand to in this natural world, God, God puts his stamp of approval and success on them. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Jesus, speaking to the church at Ephesus, and I'm about to close. Revelations chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, Repent, do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I've heard it argued about, I've read commentaries and, and read different differing opinions. I've heard people say, well, once you get baptized, once is enough for your whole life. Might be. I've been baptized three or four times. I didn't think I was baptized right, so I got rebaptized. Then, been twice, I, I felt like maybe I didn't honor the commitment like I should have. And I made myself to, to the water one more time. Is that old, dead, rotten, nasty flesh guy that I buried? Just like a zombie showed up. Stinking flesh contaminating my, my environment, my life, my family, my actions again. And I took him back to a grave. Now that's kind of how I look at first works. You say, I don't see it that way, brother. That's all right. I'm going to tell you how to see it the way I see it. But I'm, I'm telling you this. I'm a lot more comfortable knowing that the old man is in the grave. Amen. Now, in case you didn't get it, I believe in one God. I believe his name is Jesus Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. I believe you repent. I believe we probably don't repent enough. I know there's cleansing happens when I'm doing what I'm doing right now, that washing of the water by the word. There's a cleansing takes place. When you're listening to preaching, anointed preaching. That's why I feel good when I'm at home and I watch it on, on YouTube, listen to it on the radio. It does something for me. Even, even if they... You know, even, even I don't agree with a lot of the doctrine that preacher is involved in. If he's preaching the word, he don't go forth void. It does something to you. Amen. So I believe that. And I believe in water baptism. And I believe in submersion. And I believe when you go down, I'm going to say in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and, and chances are, I'm going to say, for the remission of sins. Because that's what the Bible said it was for. But I want you to understand, that operation of salvation is not what I'm doing. Amen. Obedience secures it for you. But all that, that investment.
invisible operation of that time was precious, hard, waited for, all of creation grown for blood of Christ that's being applied. That was, that was done in heaven, in the holiest of holies. Amen. And that's why, you know, we don't have to schedule a time. I was talking with a pastor the other day. And said, There's some churches believe they only baptize folks on, on Easter. We don't have to wait for that because we don't have to schedule a time. It's already been applied. We just got to get in line. Amen. Don't you love him this afternoon? Amen. He's a wonderful Lord. He's a wonderful God. Hallelujah. Let us walk in newness of life. Let us walk in that, in that as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Let us stand to our feet if you're able. This, these altars are open. Amen. I, I, I want us, if, you, if you're here and you'd like to have special prayer, I want to pray for you. And anybody else that wants to help pray, you're welcome. I, I want you to understand, this is not the Brother J.D. Ray show. I, I'd like to have about half a dozen anointed musicians up here, and I wouldn't even have to pick up a guitar. Amen. God, God continue to stir some workers and maybe... Maybe if Rebecca and I won't even have to run the, the preliminaries of the service. Now, I still probably keep a close hand on it, but you know, I, I just know what I feel, you know. What, but you know what? When it comes to prayer, I take all the prayer I can get. I, I stand in the need. What's that old song? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here you'd like to have special prayer this afternoon? This altar is open. If you'd like to just come and pray, would you come? Amen.